If you've got your Bibles, we're going to start in Ephesians. We're going to kind of go through several chapters there. I'll tell you a story. Years ago, when I was in junior high school, we had a new minister of education come to our church. His name was Dr. Kermit E. Whitaker. He had a very impressive career. He had been in student work, Baptist Student Union work for about 20 years. Then he went to First Baptist Church of Longview. Then he went to Wilshire Baptist Church. He went to Cliff Temple Baptist Church. I followed him. My first church was Wilshire because he recommended me. My second church was First Baptist Longview because he recommended me. Then I went to Cliff Temple because he recommended me. When he left local church work, he went to Dallas Baptist University, where he was a vice president. He left there to go to the Southern Baptist Annuity Board. When he retired there and gave it all up, somebody gave him the largest real estate company in all of Oak Cliff. That was about 450,000 people back then. Gave it to him. He made a lot of money in real estate. Now, when he was 50 years old, he got married for the first time. He married a lady named Betty. She was about 25 years younger than him. And people kind of stepped back and looked at that funny. But he had a child bride who was still in great shape, good looking guy, sharp as a tack, married this young lady, put her through college, put her through dental school, went her, put her through postgraduate studies, and she became a periodontist. Well, she became a periodontist and grew the largest periodontal practice in the Dallas area south of the Trinity River and was very successful. And people asked him, so Dr. Whitaker, how do you feel when your wife makes so much more money than you do? And he said, I just smile all the way to the bank. They had a wonderful, wonderful marriage. They loved each other. They were close together, and I remember in his dying days, I was in the hospital room with him, and he stood up, and he took me by the hands and said, please take care of Betty, my wife, when I'm gone. Watch out for her. Well, she didn't need anybody to take care of her, but we stayed in touch for a long, long time. She also did something for him to honor him. I want to tell you the backstory of that. There was a sculpturer named Max Greiner, and he was making bigger than life size biblical sculptures. He did one of Jesus washing Peter's feet. He made another one of Jesus standing with a fishing net, and it said, I will make you fishers of men. And he had these works, but they really weren't selling. He had gone to the Baptist General Convention meeting in Houston, Texas that year. This was back in 1990. He got there. It took him to the last minute, but he finally got a permit from the city of Houston to put one of these sculptures that was bigger than life on the sidewall in front of the convention center. And he was watching people. They were coming to the convention center, but they were talking to each other. They were looking for doors. They wanted to come in the right place. And they weren't really seeing his statue, which had very strong biblical significance. It was the one of Jesus knelt down washing somebody's feet. And he just didn't know what to do. And he prayed. And God spoke to him. There's some people believe that God didn't really speak directly to individuals except through the scripture. He definitely speaks to everybody through the scripture, but sometimes he speaks individually. And this artist asked him, said, God, what should I do? And God said, go meet the presidents of the universities here. And there were several booths set up for all the different Baptist universities in Texas, and there are quite a few of them. He walked into the convention center, he saw where the colleges were all set up. He walked up the first one, which was Dallas Baptist University. And he walked up. There were four or five guys all in suits, uh, standing in the booth. They were visiting with each other. When they walked up, the men paused. They looked at him, and he said, could you possibly tell me who the president of your university is and if he's here? Dr. Gary Cook was there amongst those four or five guys in the booth, he stepped up, he stuck out his hand, he said, I'm Gary Cook, I'm the president, how can I help you? 
And he said, this is a strange request, but I'm a sculptor. And I'm just praying, and God told me to meet the presidents of the universities and show them my work. I have a bronze sculpture across the street. Could I just show it to you? And he surprised him. He said, yeah, I'll go look at it with you right now. They walked across the street while Dr. Cook, who was a great man of prayer, while he was president for roughly 30-something years at Dallas Baptist University, every single year their enrollment went up while he was the president. He prayed that college out of financial straits. He made it better and better. He grew it a lot. But he was a man of prayer. As they stood looking, he began to weep, his eyes filled with tears as he looked at this beautiful bronze statue. And he said, I would love to have some of your sculptures on the campus of Dallas Baptist University. Could I pray with you? And he and that sculpture prayed. And he asked God to let some of his work be on the campus. Well, eventually somebody bought one and set it up. It was that one. It was Jesus washing the feet of Peter. When Dr. Whitaker died, his wife, in honor of him, gave a statue of Jesus holding the net. And several other artists said from his sculpture, that's what we think Jesus look like. And we model our Jesus's after yours. The inscription said, a servant leader ever willing to serve. An encourager ever willing to share. A friend ever eager to love. Every time I'm at DBU, I see that statue and I remember my good friend and mentor, Dr. Whitaker. That's the kind of guy that makes a great husband. It was hard for Betty to get over his loss. She knew when she married him that he'd probably die a long time before she did, and that's what happened. But he was a good servant. As we talk about marriage today, I only have two points today. One is the power that you have to have to live a godly marriage, to make the most of it. The power is the Holy Spirit of the living God. The second point is that he wants to give you that Holy Spirit power and partner with you and work with you and keep his power flowing through you. The key to the power is our submission. So we're going to start the first chapter of Ephesians. I'm going to walk through until we get to chapter 5. I'm not going to read it all at all, but I want to give you some background to know where Paul was going from the beginning of this letter until he gets to chapter 5. Chapter 1 in Ephesians, verse 17. He, he's praying for the people. He says that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and a revelation in the knowledge of him, having eyes of your hearts enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you. What are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints? And what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe? Now, just think about in your marriages, what's going to happen when you're aware of this, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, that you'll have the wisdom of Jesus. If you have that, you'll know how to handle any situation. Having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, that you know what is the hope to which he has called you. What are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints? Most of the time, when we meet somebody that we're attracted to, 
all we're looking at, all we're thinking about is everything that is wonderful about them. That's the riches that are in them. But sometimes as time goes by, we shift our focus from everything about them that is right to everything that about them is wrong. So often in Western culture, people get married because they're attracted to each other. They really like how the other person makes them feel. They just feel better when they're that person. They're laughing. They're feeling good about themselves. The whole world is seen through rose-colored glasses. It's really nice. In Western culture, they come together because of that attraction. And when they get married, sometimes it's two years later, sometimes two months later, sometimes two weeks, sometimes two days later. They realize this person is a lot more self-centered than I realized. That's the first thing that happens. And then they realize their partner's having the same experience, except the partner's thinking, this person is a lot more self-centered than I thought they were in the beginning. And then the third thing that happens is they discover we better not talk about this because he or she gets mad. And if I don't talk about this, I can bargain with them so they won't talk about this. And so you kind of get stalemated and you start a tit-for-tat relationship that's negotiated and you may stay together, but you grow farther and farther apart because you're not giving the other person what they need and what they want and what they signed up for because you love them. You're doing it because you're getting something in return. And 40 years later, when you're posing for the 40th year anniversary photos, you're standing there and you're smiling, but your heart's not in it. You've grown apart. One of the things Dr. Tim Keller says that makes a work, marriage work Two things, he says, that really make a marriage work. Number one is realizing that the biggest enemy of marriage is one's self-centeredness. Now, he says, when two people come together, if both of them realize the most important thing for me to work on in this relationship that I have authority and responsibility for is my own self-centeredness. And when people come in and realize I'm human, therefore I'm self-centered. And because that's my nature as a human, I'm going to have to have the power of the Holy Spirit in my life to overcome that. And when two people come in with that idea where they're keeping their eyes on God rather than on each other. Last week I talked about if Jesus is standing behind me, and we've got a husband over there and a wife over here, and both of them are walking toward Jesus. Every step they take, they're going to get closer and closer and closer until they get to Jesus, and then they're going to be together. So when two people are both looking at God to meet their needs rather than each other to meet their needs, that's the kiss of death. When you expect another person to do what only God can do. It's God who will heal your hurts. It's God who will make you happy, separate and apart from your circumstances. And when you put that responsibility on another human being, it's too much. They will fail and you will be disappointed. So we see this. So perfect world, two people come together and say, okay, I know the biggest enemy to my successful marriage is self-centeredness. I'm going to do everything I can to deal with mine. When two people come in with that kind of attitude, you can count on it growing and get better and easier as it goes by and lasting until somebody dies. But what if only one person does it? Or what if one person does it more than the other one? That's okay. Because I've seen it many times that one person will have that kind of relationship with God they keep working on themselves and they love their spouse no matter what the spouse does. And in time, the hard-hearted spouse begins to soften. And they've seen this modeled. And keep in mind, the law of reciprocity is huge. We reap what we sow. 
So let's say somebody's married 10 years and it's rocky, 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 rocky. But they've been so in love and so in forgiveness and so in gratitude. All these years, God promises it's going to come back to them. And in time, usually it comes back to them through their spouse. I could name dozens of people who started out unequal in dealing with their own stuff, but eventually the other partner, husbands and wives, catches up and it gets better if that first person never stops trying. Most of the time, the other one in time, sometimes a long time, will come around. And then you have people that just don't work on themselves at all. They're the ones that are constantly looking at you to heal their hurts and to make them happy. That's not the spouse's job. The spouse's job is work on themselves and submit to the other. Now, we're in Texas. This is the Lone Star State. This is an independent place, and we don't like submission. I don't like the idea of submission. I have been very much opposed to it. I don't like the idea of surrender. I go with Winston Churchill, never, never, never give up. Jesus was the most powerful being that ever set foot on this planet, and he was the most submissive. I wasn't, believe it or not, I wasn't aware of what was going on before creation. I may look old enough, but I don't remember what happened before creation began. It was just God, the Father, the Son, the Spirit. They constantly loved each other. My personal belief, the reason God created the universe, because he likes to love. And he wanted some people to love. They enjoyed forever and ever just loving each other. But wouldn't it be fun if they had some more objects of their love? Because God likes to love. So he created people. But before the creation, the Father, the Son, the Spirit were constantly submitting to each other. They were considering each other. They were treating each other. They were deferring their desires of the moment for the other ones. And they got along without conflict because that's the way they were. So we get to Ephesians chapter 3, and I'm going to come back to where I am, but I want to read 3.20 to you. Now, this is God's attitude. It says, Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly, some of your translations say exceedingly abundantly, now, to him who is able to do far more abundantly, exceedingly abundantly than all that we can ask or think, according to the power at work within us. Catch that. According to the power at work within us. Who's God going to do exceedingly abundantly more than they can ask or think? Who's he going to do that for? He's going to do that for the person whose power is at work within them. To him be glory in the church and in Jesus Christ throughout all generations forever and ever. We get to chapter 5, start in verse 15. We're going to talk about how you access the power of God. Ephesians 5, 15. Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise making the best use of the time because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. A more literal, accurate translation of that is be being filled with the Spirit. I had a fifth-generation, uneducated Pentecostal preacher who said the reason we have to be being filled is because we leak. And I think he just hit the nail right on the head there. We leak. You come to church, you may be in the best move with, move when you walk out of this place. Life is good. Everything's going fine. And you get to your car, and somebody has scraped it. They sideswiped it. You're going to leak. 
Because when you're filled with the Spirit, you're going to be filled with the fruit of the Spirit, the love, the joy, the peace, the patience, the power, the kindness, the goodness, the faithfulness, the self-control. You're going to be filled with all of those good things, but you leak because of circumstances. Now think about if you were married to somebody who is filled with the Spirit and they're bearing the fruit of the Spirit and they are just filled with love, joy, peace, Patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. That's a nice person to live with. That's somebody that's going to be very easy to get along with. That's the goal. And when we are those people who be, we're being filled constantly with the Spirit, He's going to release His power to us and through us. Addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart. Comes from the heart. Giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Submitting to one another, as we talked about last week, is not instinctive. It does not come naturally to us. That's why we need the power of the Holy Spirit. That word submit to one another. I haven't fallen to the grenade yet of wives submit to your husbands. I don't even want to go there today. We'll go there another day. But it starts out with, all of you submit yourselves to each other. Doesn't matter if you're male or female, educated, uneducated, young or old, submitting yourselves one to another. And when you do that, that means you've submitted to God. And when you're submitted to God like Jesus, he's going to start filling you up with his power. And you're going to be able to do the impossible. Because with God, Nothing is impossible. With God, everything is possible. I'm going to chase a rabbit here a little bit. God lives in a realm that's not three-dimensional like where we are. And in that realm, everything is possible. And I'm going to show you scriptures later. He invites us to come into that realm with him, the realm where everything is possible. And with his power, with the power of the Holy Spirit, God's modeled that for us. Think about the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, God showed us what he could do all by himself. Read Genesis, the creation. He spoke and the universe was created. Did he go to a lot of effort? Did it take him a long time? He spoke. That's what he chose. He probably could have just thought and it would happen, but he, for some reason, chose to speak. Maybe so we would come to realize the power that's in words. In the tongue is the power of life and death. God has delegated that to us. So we're gonna we're thinking about God. He can do anything better than we can. I promise you, Jesus is a better teacher than I am. He's a better evangelist than I am. He is the best at everything. No human being can come anywhere close to how good he is. But when we get to the New Testament, he chooses to show us through Jesus what a human can do if they're fully submitted to God and the power of God flows through them. When you look at the life of Jesus, he was empowered because he was totally submitted. He only did what he saw the Father doing. He only said what he heard the Father saying. To me, that's a huge theological issue. For years, I've asked some bright theological minds, some professors, some people who really know their stuff. 
what that means. You know, when Jesus said, I only do what I see the Father doing, what that looked like? Tell me about that. And they all talk around it like I do sometimes. People ask me questions. I don't know the answer, but I'll talk about it. I'll circle it, but I don't know. The best I've come up with to understand what that was like is Jesus said, the Father and I are one. Jesus equals the Father. Deuteronomy 30, 19 and 20. You get down to the end of 20, for the Lord is your life. God equals life. Well, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus equals life. God equals life. Jesus equals life. Jesus says, the Father and I are one. So if he only did what he saw the Father doing, he must have seen himself doing it too. I have a feeling when the disciples had gone ahead of him, he needed to catch up with him. He gets to the Sea of Galilee. He's looking at, he probably sees himself walking on the water. When he'd been traveling three days to get to Mary and Martha, Lazarus was dead. They said, Lord, why? If you come early, he'd be alive. I think Jesus saw himself walking up to the tomb and saying, and seeing himself saying, Lazarus, come forth. Go back to Genesis eleven six, 6, which I think is one of the coolest verses of Scripture in the whole Bible. And God said, nothing that they can imagine, that they can image that they can visualize that they can see will be impossible to them nothing now that's the context of the tower of babel but nothing they can see nothing they can imagine will be impossible jesus knew that scripture and with him all things were possible i don't know if that's right or wrong that's my best guess and I've thought about it for decades. He saw himself doing these things. Well, what would happen to you if you imagined yourself being a little bit more submissive to God? What if you imagined yourself refusing to get angry when traffic's backed up? What would happen if you imagined yourself when your spouse, your significant other brings up something that you fight about all the time and you just keep smiling and you don't fight and you're gentle and you're kind, what would happen if you visualized, if you imagined yourself refusing to worry, refusing to be anxious, refusing to be afraid, seeing yourself trusting God, Imagine yourself in situations when a deal goes bad. You don't worry about it. You just say, thank you, God. I guess you're protecting me for something. Imagine yourself like this. I think that's probably how Jesus did it, but he was so submitted to the people. As we submit to one another, we're being trained for submission. I was in a seminar years ago. There's a prophet named John Paul Jackson, incredibly gifted human being. He had had a couple of visits to heaven and described those things to us. He said, they're colors I'd never seen before. There were sounds I'd never seen. The music was just intoxicating. He said it had a smell to it. He would go on and on about that. Tremendous Bible teacher, very gifted. But in his seminar, we met once a month. It was on a Tuesday or Thursday night for two or three hours. And after about three or four months, he said something one night. Because the whole seminar is about hearing the voice of God, learning how to listen to God. And he made this statement, the way you listen to other people is the way you listen to God. I sat on that for a while, and when we got to the question answer time, my little hand just couldn't help but going up. And I said, I, I just don't believe what you said. Can you help me understand? I was as nice as I could be, 
But I'm thinking if God's talking to me, that he's going to have my absolute undivided attention. I'm going to have radar lock on him, and I'm going to listen like I've never listened before. And he said, your ability, your skill set is your skill set. So however you have learned to listen, that's how you're going to listen to everybody. Your skill set, your skill set. And I still didn't get it. He said, I asked more questions. He said, just a he was a runner. He was a jogger. He'd usually run about, he, he was a five-mile runner. He said, imagine, and I was a three-mile runner. I'd run three miles, 10-minute miles, three or four times a week. Love to run. Used to love to run. But I was a 10-minute miler. If I pushed and hurt myself, I could kick it up to nine, maybe eight and a half. But I would really be sucking wind. Now, if I decided to run day with somebody who was a four-minute miler, my skill set is different from his skill set. Eight and a half or nine is the best I could do because that's my level of skill. Just because I was with an all-star runner didn't mean I could run better. Just because I'm listening to God doesn't mean I'll listen to God. Your skill set is your skill set. But when you practice submitting to other people, it's going to increase your skill set of submission. And as you get better at submitting to people, you're going to be better at submitting to God. When we look in Ephesians, it goes on and it starts mixing things up because in this passage in Ephesians 5, we look at this and it's talking about human marriage, a man and a woman, and it's also talking about spiritual marriage, the bride of Christ with Christ, the groom. And he mixes them up here. Verse 22, wives submit to your own husband as to the Lord. See, you're going to learn how to submit to the Lord by submitting to another person. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Husbands. Now look at my Bible. There is from there to there. There's this much instruction to women. There is that much instruction to men. It's twice as much. So it's hard to hear, ladies, that you should submit to any man. But men get an even tougher job Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. When he gave himself up for her, let's go back to the beginning. He left the riches of heaven and became poor so that we might become rich. When he gave himself up, that meant he lived his whole life for you, a whole totally, completely sinless life. And he let them shred and destroy his body for you. It's not like he paused the football game on Sunday because somebody wanted to talk to him for a moment. It's not like he skipped a fishing trip because the wife wanted a couple of new dresses. He gave everything he had, everything he was, which was the perfect sacrifice for the church. That's how he gave himself up for her that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. The reason he gave himself up for us, for his bride, was to make us better. The fastest way for him to make us better is to submit to him. We can resist him. 
We can disagree with him. We can fight him. But this is his goal that he's just going to make us like himself, which is absolute perfection. Verse 28, in the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound. Tell you a secret. Mystery and secret are pretty much synonymous. This is the secret of marriage, and it's a mystery. They become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and I'm saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. So we go back to what God is doing. Big picture with all of us. Marriage, human marriage, prepares us for eternity. Marriage prepares us to submit one to another. We see Jesus, and it's an interesting time. We're going to Luke, go to Luke chapter 4. In Luke chapter 4, let me give it, set the stage for you. There have been 400 years of silence from God. God has not spoken for the last 400 years. We had the major prophets. We had the minor prophets. God was speaking to the prophets. People were having revelations from God. God would show up and do things with the people. But God has remained silent for the last 400 years. Jesus shows up. He's in Nazareth. He goes to the small synagogue there. It's probably about the size, more than likely, of maybe half of the choir law. It was small. The synagogues in little towns weren't that big. And he goes up there, and this is what happens. We pick up in verse 14. Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit. Now, how did he get in the power of the Spirit? He was totally submitted to God. He returned in the power of the Spirit to Galilee, and a report about him went through all the surrounding country, and he taught in their synagogues, being glorified by all. And he came to Nazareth, where he'd been brought up. And it was his custom, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and he stood up to read. And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He enrolled the scroll and found the place where it's written. That would be Isaiah 61, 1 through 3. It said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Because he's anointed me, he's enabled me, he's equipped me to proclaim good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. He's saying, I'm the one, I'm the Messiah, I'm the one you have been waiting for, for hundreds of years. I am the coming Messiah. That's what he was conveying to them. There have been 400 years of silence from God. No prophets, no prophetic words, no messages, no manifest presence of God. He's just been quiet and still. And then the Messiah shows up. This is how they responded to him. And he rolled up the scroll and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. That's like saying, you've been waiting on me. I'm here now. I'm the one. And all spoke well of him and marveled at the gracious words that were coming from his mouth. And they said, is not this Joseph's son? Now they all spoke well. They marveled. 
They were in awe of him. That word marvel, some of the scholars talk about something was happening to them. They were experiencing something when he read, when he spoke. They hadn't seen anything like this before. Sometimes when God draws near to me, the, the hair on my arms will just stand up. It's a physical experience. I can feel his presence drawing near. Last week I told you why I'm doing this series on marriage. I've had one annulment and one divorce. I've blown marriages up twice. I didn't want to teach you about marriage. Well, God sent one very well friend to tell me that's probably the best book he'd ever seen on marriage was Tim Keller's book, The Meaning of Marriage. And then three or four months later, I'm guessing maybe five or six, another very well intelligent friend told me about it again and asked if I teach a series on it. I was pretty abrupt and said, I don't think so. Mm -mm. No, I might have said I'll pray about it. Probably didn't even say that. It's just I didn't want to do it. And then about two weeks ago, I was on a ranch for the weekend with a friend and we were talking about marriage and he pulled the book off his shelf and handed it to me. That's three messages. I hadn't got it yet. I'm not about to do a series on marriage. And then the next day on Saturday, he had gone to move some bulls around on the ranch and I was at home by myself and I started reading the book and I burst into tears. That's one of the clues God uses to let me know he's drawing close. I will just get overwhelmed with emotion. I started crying and I realized three seminaries later, 70 years of life, and I never understood what marriage was supposed to be about. I was your classic. It's about me, me, me. I, I, I. I need a trophy wife. I need somebody who's going to make me look better. And that's where I was going with it. And I realized I have totally missed God on this. Very moving emotional experience. This thing is wrecking me. So I realized I did everything wrong. Wrong heart. Wrong motives. So we see this happening. These people, and there's a big point here, these people have seen the Messiah. They felt the Messiah. As he spoke the word of God, another passage of Isaiah said, just as sure as the rain and the snow come down from the heavens, watering the earth, causing it to bud and flourish, providing seed for the sower and bread for the eater, so it is with my word that comes out of my mouth, it does not return to me void. It accomplishes my purposes. That just certainly sounds like magic. Now you are the body of Christ. You were bought for a price. You belong to God. Your mouth belongs to him. So your mouth is God's mouth. When God's word comes out of God's mouth, presence happens. Jesus modeled this when he started to read the scriptures, the presence of God, the manifest presence of God showed up and people were feeling something they never felt. They felt the presence of God. It's like God is back. That's as he released his word. Now go back to the beginning. Words are so important to God. That's how he created. You're created in his image. You create things with words too. Now, the sad thing about this, they were starting to have an experience with God. And then somebody said, hey, isn't this the son of Joseph? And they're going, oh, oh, yeah. Yeah, it's just Joseph's son. Man, I'm I'm so sorry, gosh. I'm I'm embarrassed. I was I was starting to feel warm and fuzzy and felt like God had drawn near, the Messiah had shown up. And as soon as somebody brought them back to simple reality, isn't this the son of Joseph? They dismissed who he was, and they eventually took him out and tried to throw him over the side of a cliff and kill him. If they had recognized him and continued to recognize him, Nazareth would have been the center of the thing, the event that changed the world more than anything else in history. They missed it. 
How many times has that happened to you? You start feeling like, oh, I'm really getting close to God. I'm on to something here. And then somebody says something like, isn't that the son of Joseph? And brings you back to just rational, logical reasoning. And you start to miss God again. So we're going to jump to Proverbs. When you get to Proverbs, I'm going to read just a few passages because they say pretty much the same thing. Proverbs 12, verse 14. From the fruit of his mouth, a man is satisfied with good. From the fruit of his mouth, man is satisfied with good. Proverbs 13, verse 2. From the fruit of his mouth, a man eats what is good. Verse 3, whoever guards his mouth preserves his life. Let's go to chapter 18. Verse 20, from the fruit of a man's mouth, his stomach is satisfied. He is satisfied by the yield of his lips. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. And those who love it will eat its fruit. When you think about food, food is for nourishment. Food is for strength. Food is for pleasure. When you're a moral single guy, nothing's better been a really, really good meal. I'm a foodie. I really enjoy food a lot. It's one of the greatest physical pleasure. It is the greatest physical pleasure of life I have. I really enjoy a good, good meal. And that's what food is. And food was the original medicine given to us by God. So what are you doing with the fruit of your mouth? Every word is a seed. Where does fruit come from? Fruit comes from seed. Everything you think, you feel, you say, or you do, think of it as a seed. Remember the law of reciprocity. In marriage, remember the law of reciprocity. I talked about two people who are married. One of them realizes the biggest enemy of marriage is my own self-centeredness, and he or she works to do everything they can to deal with that. Therefore, they're going to love somebody who's unlovable. They're going to love somebody who doesn't carry their share of the load. They're going to keep sowing those seeds of love. And in time, God has promised they're going to reap a harvest. So what if you're always sowing love and respect and gratitude? Forget what their behavior is. You keep doing what God tells you to do, and you will be greatly rewarded. That's why in time, most of those people who didn't carry their share of the load, and somebody did, they watch them, and they see them, and they're happier than this person that's been freeloading, and they realize, I need to become more like them, and they'll change their ways, and they will step up and be a better partner. So we look at this. I heard Bill Johnson say recently, and I think this is huge. Many times believers think they're under spiritual attack. And it's not really that Satan is attacking them. It's because they have cursed themselves with the words of their mouth, by the fruit of their mouth. I hope you don't do that to yourself. I repented yesterday and I sat down and I thought, okay, I've been doing some stinking thinking. I've gone negative on some things. I've had some pity parties. I've been thinking, poor me. And I had to get back to the truth. So I began to sow seeds based on the Word of God. Now remember, when God's Word comes out of God's mouth, it accomplishes His purposes. 
And I just started with some favorite scriptures. God has not given me a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of sound mind and of self-discipline. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. God sent his word and he healed them. I can speak the word as Jesus did, as the Roman centurion said. I can speak to my body and tell it to be healed and it will be healed. And I just went on for five or ten minutes just saying things like that. Scripture tells us, let the weak say, I am strong. Some people say, are they lying? No, they're declaring and they're speaking prophetically. But when you feel weak, if you will say, I am strong, things change. Dr. Paul Youngie Cho, who pastors the largest church on the planet. He's retired now. They had 750,000 active members. We think about our mega churches, nothing compared to theirs. They had Prayer Mountain. It was a mountain with a thousand caves in it. And they kept it supplied 24-7, 365 days a year with people praying in Prayer Mountain. Huge church. Before it got that big, he called together a committee of people. He invited physicians and medical doctors and chiropractors and people of a Oriental Asian medicine and biologists and chemists and brain surgeons and psychiatrists and psychologists, anybody that would know anything about the mind and the words that we say. He said, the Bible says so much about what we say. Why is it so important? And the thing he gleaned from all of these very knowledgeable scientific people is the speech center of the brain is a predominant center. Other parts of the brain are subordinate to it. And when we speak, the speech part of the brain is connected to our entire central nervous system. So every single cell in your body gets the message of what you say. If you say, I am sick and tired, your whole body hears, I'm sick and tired, it submits and you feel sick and tired. If you say, I can't ever get anything right, your whole body is going to get that message. If you say, I'm not good enough, your body's going to get that message. If you say, we're going under, we're going under, we're going under, we don't have enough money, we don't have a job, it's going away faster, it's coming in, we're going under. You're probably going under because James said the tongue is like the rudder of the ship. It's like the bridle in the horse's mouth. What do those two things do? What does the bridle do? It takes a very strong, powerful horse with a neck about this big and twists it any way it wants that horse to go. What does that little narrow rudder do on a great big giant ocean liner that's bigger than a skyscraper in downtown Dallas? That narrow rudder controls where it goes. Your tongue controls where you go. Use it as you would a mouse and keyboard. Use it as you would a steering wheel. It's very real. I'm going to start spending time with some of my attraction coaching clients just taking time to speak good things about ourselves because it matters. It makes a difference. We see all of this in Scripture. And then, last Scripture we're going to look at today. 1 Corinthians 3, verse 9. For we are God's fellow workers. For we are God's co-laborers. We are God's synergos. That's the Greek word. That's where synergos. That's where we get our English word synergy. Now, you know about synergy. It's when the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. That means you might be one and you've got a partner who's two. And the sum of the parts would be three. But the synergistic effect may be five, six, ten, twenty, thirty, forty. 
It's when the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. That's what happens when you partner with God. And he's called you to work with him. He does most of his work today through his body on earth. And that's you. You're the body of Christ. You're the temple of the Holy Spirit. You're his creation. And you are a co-laborer. You're a fellow worker. You're a partner with him. And the more you submit, the more his power comes to you and through you. Two things today. The power of God that you need for marriage is the Holy Spirit. And the more you submit to one another, the more God releases his power because you're submitting to him when you submit to one another. And he empowers you to do good things. There's a boy named Louis, Louis Zamperini. He grew up in a Christian home. He was usually in a lot of trouble. He was a rebellious child until high school. And he got on the track team, and the coaches made him kind of toe the mark. And he did really, really well. And he went on to college, and he was on the track team. And he was doing great in track. And then World War II came along, and all good men back in those days joined the Army. So he dropped out of school. He joined the Army. He was flying over to Europe. His plane was shot down. He spent 43 days on a life raft in shark-infested water. They wrote a book about him called Unbroken. They did a movie about him called Unbroken. And after 43 days in the broiling sun, in the salt water with no fresh water to drink, with sharks literally coming out of the water and snapping, at him, trying to take him out of the life raft. It was scary. He was finally captured by the Japanese, and he spent the next two and a half years in a Japanese prisoner of war camp. There was an officer, they called him the bird. And nearly every day, he would beat and torture this man. And this man really came to hate him developed a severe case of PTSD. Finally, the war ended. He was released. He got to come home. He was married. He became an alcoholic. He was not a good husband. And the straw that broke the camel's back was one night he was in bed and he was dreaming that the bird was coming after him and beating him and hitting him and kicking him and torturing him, tormenting him in this dream. And he woke up to a scream and he realized he was on top of his wife with his hands around her throat, trying to strangle her to death. He thought he had the bird in the dream. It was his wife. She said, enough, enough. I'm out of here. I'm divorcing you. Well, she started those proceedings, and along the way, a friend said, hey, there's a speaker in town. I hear he's pretty amazing. Would you go hear him with me? She said, sure. I don't have anything else to do. It was a Billy Graham crusade. She heard the gospel. She heard about Jesus. She gave her life to Christ, and it changed her. It was a tremendous change for her, and she realized she was forgiven, and once she had received forgiveness, once she'd received the love of God, then she was able to give it to her husband, and she started talking about, I want you to go hear the speaker with me. I want you to go, and he was reluctant to go, and he said no, and no, and no. It took her several days. Finally, she drug him to the meeting. He heard the gospel. He gave his life to Christ. He was nearly immediately delivered of alcohol, and they become very, became very, very serious Christians. He'd been an Olympic athlete. He really had a career there, but his whole life changed when he met Jesus. And one of the things he wanted to do was go back to Japan, where he'd been in prisoner war camp. He wanted to find the bird and tell him that he forgave him and that Jesus loved him. 
He made the trip over there. He never found him, but he ran across other guards that had abused him. And he told all of them, I love you and God loves you and we forgive you. He made a difference. His life turned around. Once he learned to submit to God, the power of God to forgive, to love, to be grateful, to be set free from alcohol, as we submit, God releases his power to us and through us for his glory.